Hello, BookTube. You know, years ago, there was a YouTube channel that I watched regularly, a young gay couple that just went about vlogging their day and talking about what they think and what, what's happening in their relationship and whatnot. And I was always fascinated by how open they were and by how many positive comments they got in their comments field. Just They ignored their comments field, but I did not. People saying, seeing this has made all the difference in the world to me in my extremely straight-laced, extremely conservative, fundamentalist, religious, small town. It's been a lifeline for me to know that this kind of a life is possible and might be possible for me. So I largely liked what they did. But they wanted very much to be YouTube stars. Uh, and uh, one of the things you need if you're a YouTube star is a stupid catchphrase. And they came up with one. It grew organically, but then they stuck to their guns with it. And it was it was a call and response. One would say to the other, today's going to be a great day. And do you know why? And the other would say, why? And the first would say, because every day is a great day. And it grew enormously. People were repeating it in the comments section. They had many montage videos where that was just crowds of people in Central Park or on streets or on sidewalks just responding that way because they were familiar with the channel. Auditoriums of people shouting that out as just, we need an anthem and you've provided us with one. I think there was an, a case of a young couple naming their newborn child every day. And I pointed out in their comment section, just very unobtrusively, I wasn't trying to pick a fight. I just said, you know, it's great that you're changing people's lives, but you are human beings. You don't have to be catchphrases. And if you're going to pick a catchphrase, you should pick one that isn't so obviously wrong. Every day is not a great day. Obviously, every day is not a great day. That's the whole point of living, is that some days are better than other days. And I would get shouted down, not by them, not necessarily by them, but by people in the comments section say, oh, you're so negative, oh, you're a hater. And I would respond to those people and say, there is no anger here on my part at all. And I'm not yelling. I'm asking you. I'm not asking them anymore. Since you responded to my comment, I'm asking you. Is every day a great day for you? And I'm not talking about days that you could make better if your attitude were different. I'm talking about days that are better than others. And not one of those people came back to me and said, no, well, if, if these two say it, then it must be true. No, they said, no, no, you know, you're actually right. I see what you're saying. It just, they do such good in the community and whatnot. I've never noticed the existence of anything that convinced me of a gay community. But I couldn't deny that they were doing good for a lot of their viewers. It's just that catchphrase bothered me a lot. And they happened to be making videos. I don't think they still are. But they happened to be making videos on a day when there was a gigantic mass shooting at a gay nightclub. Lots and lots of people dead. And they made a video that only very tangentially touched on it. And I left a comment saying, according to the last 120 videos that you've made, today is a great day. And it, it was the most stark demonstration of the point that I'd been making to them for months. Eventually I stopped watching the channel because it was all I could think about. Because they weren't going to let it go because it's a good catchphrase. Not because it makes any sense at all, but because it's a good catchphrase. But obviously it's stuck in McCraw. <laughs> I have thought about it on and off ever since. This, this drive that some people feel when they get on social media, when they get on YouTube, especially when they start to get a little traction, a little success on YouTube, this drive that some people feel to be fake, just to be phony, those two young men knew perfectly well that every day is not a great day, but they like a catchphrase, and they like the ability to get an auditorium of people to say something because they tell them to. And I see that. Of course, I was brand new to YouTube at the time, but now I see that everywhere. Ordinary people sitting in their spare room at home will say, we'll get to that right after the break. You're not on TV. You're in your spare room. You're filming for 500 people. You don't act that way. That's not the way a normal person acts, and so on and so forth, all the way down the line, right down to the tech bro channels that have adapted their speech to sound like androids, where all of the, the stresses are wrong in their speech. It's designed to make them sound like they were an AI. 
or an airline stewardess who said the same thing a million times. And that's not a way a normal person thinks. It's not a way a normal person acts. And I don't know why it would be the goal of a normal person to want to be that way. And yet, it has penetrated every inch of YouTube, including parts of BookTube, where people will put on a fake smile and pinwheel and antic and scream and you guys and graphic it up. And the instant the camera stops, they're like, ah, F this, I hate this so much. I just want my bonds to sell out, that's all. <laughs> when you did this to yourself, you did this all yourself. Uh, and you might think, what a weird way to start a video. <laughs> Why, ordinarily we have to work you up to having a bee in your bonnet. Here you've started out right away with a bee in your bonnet. The reason this particular bee is in my bonnet is because today was not a good day. Today has not been a good day. I'm going to make a couple of videos now, even though it's after. I don't, there was no natural light all day, but there was more light earlier. And I just, I'm going to make a couple of videos today and talk to my imaginary booktube friends because that almost always cheers me up. But today has not been a good day. It, it came to me, there are, of course, there's a blur in what constitutes one day and the next, since I don't sleep the way you do. And my front-facing, forward-facing, online day yesterday ended very poorly. It ended with my suddenly realizing that none of my machines can do live streams. Chrome, on any of my devices, cannot live stream. It can live stream, but I can't see myself. So, which obviously is a deal breaker for me. That's too much of a psychic disconnect. No idea if this will also affect anything else. I naturally, when I was going from one device to another, not only was I in the back of my mind thinking this must have something to do with all the updating that David Murphy did when he was here. He, I don't think there was a single device that he didn't touch. Uh, and to the benefit. I'm not blaming him. It was, it's a side effect that I don't think either one of us anticipated. Uh, but also... While I was going from device to device, I was getting more and more angry, uh, which is very, very bad. That is very, very bad. I am, I, I am a normal person, just like anybody else. I would put my pants on one leg at a time if I ever wore them. <laughs> but I must not have any truck with anger. Simple as that. I must not have any. I must never be angry. I don't. I don't, I don't do it well at all. I do all the other emotions well, but I don't do that well at all. And I could, I knew that. I knew that while it was happening. I knew after five machines that the sixth machine was not suddenly going to mysteriously give me the ability to stream. Uh, and I kept doing it until I was just incensed. Uh, and I then unplugged from everything. Unplugged from the world. Just uh, walked Frida around a lot. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to do because although we're on the doorstep of April, it's bitterly cold here. And the, the wind just will not stop. It will not go below 20 miles an hour. So it's not just that it's bitterly cold. It's that you are definitely reminded of it the minute you go outside. Uh, but I unplug from everything. And that blurs together with how bad today has been. But today has been... Every day is not a great day. And there's, that is not always your fault. In fact, it's lot, oftentimes not your fault. Uh, for instance, Frida is feeling sick again. She had diarrhea a few days ago. And it was very discreet. She knew exactly what was wrong. It wasn't panicking her in any way. She knew what needed to be done. I will. I can hold. I will let you know. I need to go outside right away. I can hold this just long enough for you to get me outside. Uh, and then when she was done, all right, I think I'm ready to go back inside. It was anything like the kind of the kind of oh my is the world ending panic that I've had from other dogs in that situation. Not Frida. Frida doesn't panic. Uh, but it went away. It it fixed itself up and. I didn't think about it again. And then today, it wasn't diarrhea, but she is feeling sick to her stomach. And I, it's not bad. It's not bothering her too much. It's, she's still capable of being happy. She still has an appetite. She can still sleep peacefully. But it's definitely there. And it, I don't know what the reason is. And I'm, that's just, I'm sure that it will just cure itself. I'm sure that it will fix itself. She's not a puppy anymore. But she's not old. She's in the prime of her health. It'll be years before she starts to experience age. So it's nothing. It's transient. She, unlike my, my previous, one of my previous dogs, my pointer, ate anything off the ground. At first, in her first few years, when she would do that, and I would explicitly tell her in our own language, not in English, not quit it, oh, cut it, oh, stop. But in her own language, I would tell her, that action makes me angry. 
And if you are uh, in the canine family, if I say that, you stop doing that action. No threats. That action makes me angry. She knew that and absolutely could not stop herself for her whole life. Her whole life. And at first I thought that that was triggered by oliphatic acids. It was triggered by at least something that was the least bit organic. But by the time she was 10, she was popping down rocks, twigs, uh, the corpses of dead baby birds. I, uh, and, and since I had two dogs at the time, I couldn't always stop her. I couldn't always anticipate it. Although sometimes it seems supernatural. Sometimes we'd be walking on, in, on a hot afternoon on a completely bare stretch of concrete and she would, I would still, I would look away for a second, I would come back, and her whole mouth would be full of something that she was hardly swallowing without chewing. Because she knew it angered me. Uh, Frida doesn't do that. She doesn't eat anything off the ground. She doesn't do, that, that would strike her as really dumb, <laughs> kind of needy to do. She doesn't do anything like that, so it can't be anything like that. Who knows what it is? Uh, I suppose it's possible that when I wasn't here or when I wasn't looking, she ate a bug. Something like that. I, we don't have any, but I, I, it's the only thing I can think of. But that has been part of the day, is that she's not feeling well. She's not self-pitying. She's just not feeling well. In addition to that, uh, the rain that has been predicted so far has not arrived, but it's been dark as twilight all day long. You could barely tell that the sun had risen first thing this morning. Frida has not wanted to move. She is a little solar battery. If there's bright sunlight, she's very happy. If there isn't, she's miserable whether it's raining or not. And I, it's been it's been the better part of a decade now that I've been living with her. And I'm starting to absorb that from her. So that when it's dark like this, dark and gloomy and also bitingly cold, uh, it, it, it drags on me as well. Uh, and then... First thing this morning, first to start a business this morning, I had a video conference. I was worrying the whole time that I, in addition to not being able to make video conferences, I wouldn't be able to accept them, invites to them either. Uh, I don't have anybody here who can who can just, somebody's going to have to come over here and fix these things. There's no way to step walk me through the fix myself. Someone's going to have to come over here and do the one fix on Chrome that will fix this on 10 devices. And I don't know when that's going to happen. That might not ever happen. So I was worried this morning. I sent out a precautionary email saying, you know, I'm, I might not be able to pick this up. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties at this end. But I'll try clicking on an invite. It's one thing I did not try last night. And it worked. Whatever is the glitch here, it didn't stop me from, from the camera from connecting when I picked up someone else's invite to, in this case, a group call, a group video call, a preliminary call, for a project that I had I'd been approached about, I thought it sounded really interesting. Uh, and I was, the first instant, the feeling I had was, what a relief. Uh, Frida's feeling fine. She is batting down for the morning. We, we went out. There were, no, there were no troubles. It's gloomy outside, but this link is at least working. And there were, you know, little headshots of a whole bunch of different people. People were going to be involved in this project. And the woman who was running the meeting started it by uh, welcoming everybody and saying that we should all go around clockwise on the screen, introduce ourselves, and give our pronouns. So I exited the meeting, and then I emailed her and said, I'm, I, I'm sorry to inconvenience you, but I'm exiting the project as well. And she said, you know, I, I saw you exit the meeting, and I thought maybe it was this technical problem that you talked about, but why are you leaving the project? You seemed excited about it. I said, I'm not... Uh, I'm not I'm not inclined to give a reason, but I am I am leaving. You won't be hearing from me again. And that was neat and clean, of course. There was no doubt in my mind about that decision, but it did sound like an interesting project. And also, how could I not view it as a token of the future? It just It wasn't just a discrete thing. It happened, and then it bothered me. It added to the things that were bothering me. Then I read... Uh, of course, I retreat into books, as you would do if you're having a day like this. I read a book. I should have gone with my instincts. My instincts told me, read some of those indie books that you're getting for free every day. Read some of them. They have all the best intentions in the world, and one of them might be really good. And then you'll find a new author. I found a bunch of authors that way. But instead, I read a new release. Uh, and it was about as flagrant an example of critic-proofing a book as I have seen so far in 2024. The author was all but crossing her arms and saying, 
I dare you to say anything about this book. I showed up. And that is literally all the hell I need to do. All you do at this point is compliment me. Praise me for my bravery. That's all you do. And that isn't true. That simply isn't true. Even in the 21st century, that isn't true. I am a critic. I could not care less what biological sex you are, what biological sex you want to be, what biological sex you sleep with, the, the color of your skin, how much extra money your parents or single parent had when you were a child. I do not care about, I care about all of that as a person. Of course I do. If you want to come over here for wine and calzones, I will hold your hand and ask you a million questions about what that was like. And I will also ask you, as I have done to many people who've come over here, how can I help? Is there a way that I can help you? If you come over here and do that. But if you make a product, any kind of product, but especially a product that uses your creativity, that uses words, and you put it into the market for money, none of that applies. I could not care. Once you do that, I'm talking about the product, not you. I could not care less what your melanin count is, or what kind of clothes you wear, or... I couldn't care less about any of that. I care about whether or not the book works. Once you make a book and put it into the market for money, you introduce another choice of many, many choices that are presented to the only people I'm beholden to, my readers. I'm going to, I want to tell them about that choice. And this book was arms crossed just saying, I dare you to do that. I dare you to. That is not what I, this book, exist for. I exist for you to praise. I'm giving you an opportunity to praise me. You should consider yourself lucky. I, I put the book away. Fortunately, I was not commissioned to review it. I, I may rip it to shreds. I don't know. I, it comes a point when, you know, when it, there comes a point when I would wonder that I, that's all I would be doing. Uh, so I, I put it away and I turned to email and there was an email from a prospective freelancer, someone who would like to write, to try their hand at writing book reviews. Those of you who are new to the channel, and now I'm sure are regretting your choices. <laughs> uh, I'm an, a book section editor, both for a print newspaper in uh, Georgia, a very, very small book section in Georgia, perhaps the smallest circulation newspaper in the country. I, and I'm also one of the editors on an online literary journal called Open Letters Review, uh, which is fairly well regarded and gets around. We are on, we're on, we're blurbed on the covers of books that you've seen, many of them, maybe some that you own. Uh, and we have been for a long time. Open Letters Review is the successor to Open Letters Monthly. That's a long time. That's, that's 15, 16 years. Uh, and in not, maybe not so much for Georgia, but in that, in that capacity for Open Letters Review, I, the, the, the door is open. If you want to try your hand at book reviewing, I'm happy to help you. And once we get a book review worked into good enough shape to run, it can run on Open Letters Review. And you, you want to do 10 of those, you'll have a string file of 10 edited reviews that you can then pitch to some other venue. You can move around from venues. It's an ex I have no illusions about the, the, the size or strength of Open Letters Review. We are a launchpad. But we've been a launchpad for a number of people, just like Open Letters Monthly was before us. I don't ask much in return for that offer. That offer is... It's pretty rare. Most or most journals, even free online journals, do not make that offer. I, I don't ask much in return. <laughs> I don't. I don't, really. I will work with you. I will help you. It's far from uh, uh, asking much in return. I'm offering more than just that offer. But I, I turned to my emails, and I had a freelancer who was to <laughs> every kind of attitude in the world. And my reaction to such things is always twofold. One, I think, uh, part and parcel of what you're offering here is not just edits on pieces. It's also advice to people who don't know what they're doing and who are making all sorts of beginner mistakes. Part of what you're offering here is the advice gently offered to get them to stop making those mistakes before they get into that bigger for-pay world. But on days like today, the other part of my reaction is just, I don't need this at all. I don't, I don't need this at all. Just, just stomp and go. 
And I was caught on the horns of those two today with this one prospective freelancer. I was saying, uh, I've got this piece. I, I'd love to describe it to you. It's a perspective review of, you know, book X, Y, and Z. And I, I'd love to tell you, you know, my thoughts on it and my take on it. And I wrote back and said, uh, what any book editor will say, any book, any book section editor will say the same. No book section editor wants to hear that pitch. <laughs> I know that you don't believe that, but none of them do. They're all going to know instantly whether or not they want a review of the book that you've mentioned. If they know what they're doing, they're going to know the book, and they're going to know whether, they don't, whether or not it fits the parameters that they asked for and whether or not they want it. And that was true with me. I saw it, and I wrote back and said, you know, there's actually no reason for the pitch at all. The book is a perfect candidate. Go to. And then we'll work on the review once we have something to talk about. And the person wrote back and said, no, if it's okay with you, I would like to describe my thought process here and, and try to sell you on the idea. Uh, and then proceeded to do so. The, the, that review was the long pitch. I didn't read it. I read the first sentence. I left the rest of it unread. It was like 10 more paragraphs. I left the rest of it unread and wrote back and said, I didn't read the rest of your email because you started off by telling me that you're just going to ignore what I want. I'm your editor. And I'm telling you I don't want a pitch. Feel free to write the review and then we'll have something to talk about. Uh, and the person wrote back and said, well, I, you know, no offense, but I, I think that my pitch is important. And I wrote back, I don't know why I was doing this. The day was bad enough already. I wrote back and said, what you are doing right now is arguing with your editor. And you must never do that. Never. Never. You must never do that. I am the only editor you are going to deal with from here until the death, the last day of your earthly life, who's going to be back here two emails later after you're arguing with them. No other editor is going to do that. They're going to drop you and they're going to make sure that other editors drop you. So don't do it. What you're doing right now, don't do. You're arguing with the person who's trying to publish you. I don't want your pitch. If you write back to me in response to this email with anything other than, okay, I'll get right on it, please don't contact me again. And the person wrote back and said, okay, I'll get right on it. But what did he do? He put the line, okay, I'll get right on it in quotes. So I know, I don't know if this person's watching this video, but I know already, if you are watching, I know what you're going to do. I know the next four things you're going to do. Please don't think that you are the first type of yours that I have encountered, the first person acting this way that I have encountered. You are not. There is nothing in the editorial world that I have not encountered. You are not the first person, nor the 500th person to do this. I know the next four things you're going to, you're going to do in the order in which you're going to do them, and it's a waste of both our times. <laughs> I don't know where 20 somethings get this kind of attitude. This person I checked, I did, I did more checking than I should have because I was angry, has no experience whatsoever of any kind. None whatsoever of any kind. No editing, no writing, no freelancing, no proofreading, no nothing. <laughs> I don't know where people who are at the bottom there get that kind of attitude. Unless it's the Dunning-Kruger effect, or maybe it's just that they've been pampered by every teacher and mentor figure in their entire lives. And I, what I should have been told, telling myself at that moment was there are plenty of people who contact you through wanting the opportunity that Open Letters Review represents that are the exact opposite of that. They want to learn. They, they want to, to adapt. They're perfectly happy to take advice, especially once they start to see the advice pay off. I should have said that. I should have concentrated on all those positives, but this was just one more brick in a rotten, rotten day. <laughs> just a rotten day. Plus, there's an article I'm waiting for, a piece, a thing that I'm waiting for in the mail that simply will not come. No matter what, it will not come. And you reach a point where you think, okay, a watch pot never boils, but... There comes a tipping point when you think, okay, this might just be lost. And when every time I've been tempted to think that way about this particular item, I thought, when's the last time something went lost? You don't even think about it. You get hundreds of pieces of mail every week. Nothing goes lost. You send dozens and dozens of pieces of mail every week. If you don't send them outside the country, nothing ever gets lost. Delays? Sure. That's all. It's just delayed. Don't even think about it. The next time you think about it should be when you see it. But nevertheless, I couldn't help it. <laughs> and these things all just piled up. They all just piled on. And I could go on. It's been 25 minutes of sheer complaining. And I could go on. Because some days just are not good. They are just rotten days. Maybe what I should have done, 
was just acknowledge that. I can be a little stubborn when it comes to days like this. Maybe I should I should have just acknowledged at 11 this morning. I maybe I should have just acknowledged, look, that's the way this day is going to be. Batten down the hatches, do everything that needs doing in this day between now and noon and then just give up. Just just give up. Just pull in, don't look at anything, don't try anything, don't even go online. Just curl up with your dog on your lap in bed and read a paper book. Nothing can happen to a paper book. Just do that. All a paper book can do is be bad. It, it, maybe I should have done that, but I didn't. <laughs> so, so here we are. So here we are. There you go. I will leave a note in the show notes of this video to announce that this is when the mail starts at the 25-minute mark. But I had to... <sighs> I don't let these things gather momentum. I am a, uh, despite the comments that I made to those two YouTubers years and years ago, I am an absolutely firm believer that every day is a miracle. It might not be a good miracle. It might be very irritating. But it is amazing to be here. Amazing. In about five minutes, it's all going to be over. It could go at any minute, at any time. And there's nothing else. So this is, I, I'm a firm believer this is all amazing. And I know there's, I have far more, even in scenarios that I've just described, far more to be happy about than to be to, to be depressed about. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, it's been a day. So I thought we'd go now, finally, at 25 minutes, we'll go through the mail. I got a periodical, for instance. I got the, the London Review of Books. With a big marquee article by Pankaj Mishra about... Uh, the, I gather, I haven't read it yet, but the moral arguments, the, the more, whether or not Israel, whether or not, uh, whether or not Israel sacrifices any kind of moral high ground that it gained with the Holocaust by its actions in Gaza, raising neighborhoods, uh, strafing relief columns, killing children and women, uh, to, we're not talking about killing women or children, you know, where you you attack a dozen militants and a woman and child across the street happen to get hit by a stray bullet. We're talking about 19, 20,000 people, 20,000 dead women and children. Uh, the greatest war crime of the 21st century, unfolding right now in real time, being filmed, with the participants laughing and joking and sending laughing and joking camcorder videos to their friends and family that are making it onto the news and getting cheered in the public square in Israel. Uh I think I can predict what Pankaj Mishra is going to write on that subject. I'm pretty sure that I can predict uh, that his overarching conclusion will be that thanks to Israel's long occupation of Gaza, it had no moral high ground anyway. Uh, but we will see. He, this author has surprised me before, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways. He can irritate me, definitely. And there are a whole bunch of other things in here that I'm, I'm sure I will find interesting. And then there are two packages, and I will annotate I will annotate this video to make sure. Just I, I feel a little bit better venting to my imaginary book tree friends. But you might not. You might be having a rotten day of your own. So uh, let's just let's just go at the packages. Of course, uh, the first one doesn't open. Uh, I am going to upload this video. Uh, the first one doesn't open. Uh, I am amazed. I am absolutely amazed that, that this right here, the bolt holding the scissors together, didn't just pop off. I'm amazed that that didn't happen. Uh, but it didn't, so <laughs> maybe things are looking up. Uh, let's take a look at what we have here. I had to cut the package open so the book will be worthless. Uh, but maybe this will... Oh, okay, great. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, I was wondering about this. This is a finished copy of something that we've already seen. Uh, this is the finished copy of Sharp's Command by Bernard Cornwell, the latest in the Sharp series. Uh... Uh, so what have we got here? Are you going to anything? No, I don't care what the Chattanooga Express had to say about this. Uh, I already know what the author looks like. So I don't, don't need that either. Here we go. Uh, let's see here. So when does this come out? April 2nd. Uh, let's see here. The impossible is exactly what the formidable Captain Sharp is asked to do when he sent on an undercover mission to a small village in the Spanish countryside far behind enemy lines. For the quiet, remote village sitting high above the Almaraz Bridge is about to become the center of a battle for the future of Europe. Two French armies march towards the bridge, one from the north and one from the south. If they meet, the British are lost. 
Only sharp, small group of men, with their cunning and courage to rely on, stand in their way. But they're rapidly outnumbered, enemies are hiding in plain sight, and as the French edge ever closer to the front line, time is running out. And this got a starred review from Kirkus Reviews. Oh, uh, fantastic. Okay, well, I have the advanced copy of this, and ordinarily I would... Uh, ordinarily I would... I would bump a sharp series these, these are really really good those of you who don't know the sharp series there's you've got a lot of books to go through there were once upon a time i think they might still be made in a very attractive trade paperback set from penguin uh but these are uh historical fiction adventures set on land during the napoleonic wars that are terrific they are absolutely terrific i am hoping in my heart of hearts i don't uh, given what today has been like I don't even really want to think it, but I'm hoping that I can get Mark Richardson to write a review of this book for Open Letters Review. He very seldom has time to write book reviews. Uh, he's good at it, though, when he does, and he knows the series as well as I do. Uh, I'm hoping that that will happen. It might be forlorn, because he's probably incredibly busy. But, uh, but anyway, that is one package, and then we'll move on to the next one. The next one has a, an encouraging amount of weight to it, uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, okay. All right. Fantastic. All right. I have been uh, emailing back and forth with the publicist of this book. Uh, well, no, actually, I better keep that. Uh, I've been emailing back and forth with this publicist. Uh, great. Fantastic. Okay. So you come out, oh, late March. All right. This is coming out on Tuesday. Uh, this is by Keith O'Brien, and it is called Charlie Hustle, the, F the Rise and Fall of Pete Rose and the Last Glory Days of Baseball. And there is Pete Rose on the cover during a rare moment of physical activity for the sport of baseball. Uh, maybe there was a donut truck. Maybe that's what he's running for. <laughs> uh, Pete Rose bounded out of the dugout like a hurricane, spinning unfettered through the world. He slid headfirst into bases in the midst of dust and fury. He sprinted out walks like a teenager. He was loud, brash, supremely confident, entirely focused. He approached every game with ferocity and raw emotion, like, often like he was in the middle of the barroom brawl, and he endeared himself to fans because of it. He seemed to manufacture runs out of pure willpower. He racked up mind-boggling stats and awards and streaks and wins and pennants and titles with seeming ease. When his team needed clutch hits, he provided them. When glory was 90 feet away, he reached for it. He bowled over catchers at home plate, shouted at pitchers to intimidate them, and ripped through middle infielders to break up the play. He would beat them all, one way or another. Pete Rose would never back down. Could never back down. Okay, all right. All right, maybe the pub sheet writer should switch to decap. Uh, this spring, uh, Keith O'Brien will present the gritty and gripping new biography of the flawed legend, baseball's tragic character, the man who could never return to the game he lived to play. It is a story unlike any other in baseball history, a story of virtuosity and success, addictions and secrets, recklessness, and many missed opportunities for salvation. Okay. Uh, all right. Fantastic. Well, this comes out very soon. It comes out uh, very soon. Very interesting. A very interesting little mail. It's only two books. But I, obviously, those of you who are longtime viewers of this channel will remember Zach from the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, a friend of mine who is also a baseball junkie, just knows the sport inside and out. I would like him not only to review this book, but to interview the author on this channel. And I don't know what progress there is. Now that I have the finished copy, I guess I can I can start figuring that out tomorrow. Uh, which I sincerely hope will be a better day than today. I really, really hope that's true. Uh, but anyway, the thing that's interesting here is that I got two finished copies in the mail, and both of them are books that I'm kind of hoping somebody else will review. That never happens on this channel. I got Pete Rose and the new Sharps novel. Uh, and I don't, I would like ideally someone else to review both of these. <laughs> so, uh, but that's it. Uh, no other packages that I could find. Uh, so that's that's it for the mail. That's it for my little therapy session. Uh, I'm going to make, I think, one more video. It is Tuesday. I want to do a tag video. But other than that, I'm going to quit. I waited way, way longer than I should. So I'm uh, once I do that, once I talk with my imaginary booktube friends, I'm going to quit. I'm very pointedly not going to look around for fugitive, neglected pieces of technology here that might be able to do a live stream. It is clearly not the piece of technology. 
it is clearly Chrome itself that won't do it. Uh, I, I, and there's not going to be a solution. I can't do it. Someone else is, not, and no one can walk me through it either. Someone's going to have to come here and make the change themselves. And that someone will almost certainly have to be David Murphy, which means no live streams until he comes back. So that's, we, we shall see. Uh, I have to remind myself, I had to remind myself, I tried to remind myself many, many times today, uh, that I, last night when I attempted a Steve stream, it was the first one that I'd attempted in weeks and weeks. So it's not like, it's not like a, I'm a Twitch streamer who's, you know, got $40,000 a day riding on the line. I don't, I don't do these things often. So videos still work. Whatever updates did or did not affect uh, streaming did not affect YouTube, the normal course of YouTube. So, uh, so there you go. That is a mail hall and a kvetch session of epic proportions. I appreciate all of you, <laughs> any of you who actually listen to all of this. I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to stress that uh, oh, oh, some of you I, I wary, you touch me by wearing, I want to stress that I'm perfectly okay. This is just a, a rotten day. It's just been a rotten day. And I would also like to humbly ask that you not make things worse. <laughs> okay, so kindly don't uh, email me with step-by-step -step recipes for how I can, you know, connect a camera on live stream. <laughs> kindly don't do that. I, I, and also... Uh, to a, a much more rarefied group of people, people who might be considering taking up my offer for Open Letters Review, kindly don't let this video put you off. One potential freelancer making every mistake in the book and not backing down, well, that's a creature of the 21st century. In the 21st century, that's what you do. You are never wrong under any circumstances. You are never contrite. You never apologize. You don't even know what an apology is. And everything you do is by nef definition right because you're branded. Because you're you're a brand, not a person. None of that is true, and none of that is true. That is all just the sickness of social media. And this person, the person that I've been dealing that I dealt with earlier today, just had that sickness right up to his eyeballs, just right up to his eyeballs. So so that you there's no such thing as experience, and if there is, I have it all. No one else has any. So this guy that's making this offer to me, he can't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to override him. So he's going to tell me, please don't give me your pitch for this book. Just write the review. And I'm going to give him the pitch anyway, because what do I care what he thinks? <laughs> what do I care what he wants? What do I care what anybody wants? Um, don't be put off by that anecdote. I still want you to try your hand at book reviewing. Not these two books. I have reviewers in mind for both of these, but something else. If you have any inclination, if you feel like you might want to try it, who knows, you might like it. You might be really good at it. Uh, it's just this one person that's on my mind. And again, I, w I want to stress here, if you, the one person that I'm talking about, if you happen to be watching this video, don't do the next thing you're going to do. Just don't do it. I already know what it is. You put air quotes around the line that I sent you. So I already know what the next thing you're going to do is. We've already discussed what I want from you. I said, we don't have anything to talk about right now because there isn't a review. So why don't you read the book and then write up a review of it? No more than 800 words and send it to me and then we'll have something to talk about. We'll know whether it's a question of style. We'll know whether or not it's a good review. You've never written one before. It might be, it might be terrible. I already know what you're going to do. You're going to write 2,500 words. I don't know what to say other than don't. Don't do it. Don't waste your time. <laughs> but, but I get the impression I get the impression that you're not going to listen to that. So, but God knows the last thing I need to do is store up aggravation that hasn't happened yet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut my losses while I can, and I'll do a feel good tag as well in an attempt to make myself feel good, <laughs> and then I'll just cash it in and I will try to think to get things back to normal tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now. Thank you very much for listening, Booktube. I'll be back. <laughs>